Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of the Net Cells Medical Series. Um, I'm just going to ask Ali to put the presentation mode on for the, um, there we go, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for dialing in. Um, we are very excited to bring you our next installment, where we're going to be looking at uh, cord blood stem cells in the treatment of leukodystrophy disorders, and in particular, we'll be looking at crab disease. This was uh, prepared by Ashley Welsh, who is one of our uh, medical technologists, and it's going to be presented by our medical director, Dr. Yvonne Holt, as well as our chief science officer, Professor Carolyn Niesler. So I'll be handing over to them. Uh, if you've got any questions, please remember to send them through and we can do a question and answer session at the end, um, at the, end of the presentation. So uh, handing over to you, Carola. Thanks, Jenny. Um, just to reiterate, thanks very much to Ashley Welsh for uh, all the work that she put in to put together this presentation. Right, so um, I'm going to be talking about leukodystrophy disorders. And um, to start off, just to say that the term leukodystrophy refers to a group of more than 40 different types of rare progressive metabolic disorders. They arise from genetic mutations that either prevent the normal formation or promote the destruction of the myelin sheath. So myelin is the protective coating found around nerve cells, and this coating allows action potentials to be conducted quickly, approximately 100 times faster than when you compare um, the myelinated to unmyelinated. So this myelin really allows for that action potential to, to move quickly. And it does so along the axon of the cell, and demyelination, therefore, affects the brain, the spinal cord, as well as the peripheral nerves, and ultimately disrupts the pathway of messages from the central nervous system to the rest of the body. As a result of this, the common symptoms associated with these disorders include, for instance, loss of cognitive function, loss of sensation, loss of motor function, such as movement, speech, and eating. Examples of leukodystrophy disorders include Adrenal leukodystrophy, where the myelin sheath is affected due to the accumulation of very long chain fatty acids, and metachromatic leukodystrophy, where the myelin sheath is destroyed due to the accumulation of sulfatides, and these are glycolipids. And finally, Krabber disease, which is the focus of the current presentation. Next slide, please. So Krabbe disease was first described in 1916 by Knut Krabbe, a Danish neurologist, and he described five patients observed to display severe neurodegenerative disease. And these were infants, and, um, and he was um, recently, actually, a, a couple of years ago, a um, paper was published to tribute um, the work and the life of, of this um, neurologist. So Krabbe disease is an autosomal recessive uh, disease and is estimated to affect one in 100,000 individuals in the population. It's caused by a deficiency in the enzyme galactoserebrosidase, and there are actually 140 known mutations that can cause this deficiency. And these include some point mutations as well as deletions of longer nucleotide sequences. As a result of this deficiency, compounds such as cycosine and galactosylceramide accumulate in the neural cells, such as oligodendrocytes, as well as in macrophages. And this results in toxicity, as well as changes in cellular phenotype. So oligodendrocytes um, are important because they're the myelin-producing cells, and compounds that are toxic to these cells will therefore contribute to a loss of myelin and then result in axonal damage. Astrocytes, which are the most widely found cell within the central nervous system, react to this damage, leading to a state known as reactive astrocyte gliosis, which further inhibits neural regeneration. This gliosis is also in part driven by the formation of so-called globoid cells. Now, although the mechanism of their formation is poorly understood, they are thought to be giant multinucleated cells, though they are in fact giant macrophages filled with galactose or ceramide. So this disease is mainly observed to occur in infants. So you have your early infantile or late infantile 
um, types. And then occasionally this disease can develop later and is then referred to either as juvenile, adolescent or adult or late onset. Next slide, please. So symptoms in early infantile cover disease uh, generally deliver, develop within the first six months of life and include, for instance, irritability, difficulty feeding, decreased mental and motor development, limb stiffness, seizures, vomiting, and unexplained crying. And unfortunately, these children often die between the ages of two and four. The disease is diagnosed by measuring the activity of the enzyme in leukocytes or skin fibroblasts, as well as further genetic analysis to detect the causes of mutations. So in the infantile form of Krabber disease, a 30 kb deletion is responsible for 35 to 45% of cases occurring in individuals of Mexican or European ancestry, respectively. So this differs from the adult onset form of the disease, which is often characterized by a mutation at position 809, which changes the glycine at that position to an alanine. Now, the only effective treatment for this disease is, in fact, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Next slide, please. So galactosyl ceramide is a major component in the formation of myelin. And galactoserebrosidase, which is also referred to as galactosyl ceramidase, is a lysosomal hydrolytic enzyme which removes galactose from the substrates such as galactosyl ceramide and galactosyl sphingosine. So these two structures are shown here. And if you remove the galactose component of, for instance, galactosyl ceramide, then you're left with um, the ceramide component. And if you remove the galactose component from the galactosyl sphingosine on the right, then you're left with sphingosine. Now, these are sphingolipids that are highly enriched in the nervous system and where they're critical components of plasma membranes and are crucial for correct brain development and function. Next slide, please. So if that enzyme doesn't work, the galactoserebrosidase, then the structures such as cytosine can accumulate and this ends up being toxic to the cells of the central nervous system. In addition, cytosine is generated catabolically through the deacylation of galactosyl ceramide by acid ceramidase. So on the previous slide, we showed how the galactose was removed to give rise to the ceramide and the, the sphingosine. And what happens is if that enzyme is not present, then the, um, uh, the conversion of the galactosyl ceramide to ceramide cannot occur. So Ali, if you just um, push next slide, please, and you'll see the, the animation first come in. So that, is that, that um, reaction um, has been shown to be crossed out to, to indicate that you cannot get generation of ceramide, and so you get accumulation of the galactosyl ceramide. And as a result, the acid ceramidase can then work on that um, and catalyze that reaction to give rise to cycosine. So the effect of cycosine is that um, it will disrupt raft architecture and affects maturation and differentiation of myelin forming cells and causes oligodendrocyte apoptosis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the next slide. So all of this then leads to demyelination, but interestingly, it doesn't actually affect oligodendrocyte precursor proliferation. Next slide, please. So if we look at the mechanism of action and focus first on membrane structure, then under normal conditions, sphingomyelin-enriched microdoveins are found on neurons and on oligodendrocytes. So this is shown um, on the left. These microdomains or rafts assist in compartmentalization of singling activity, which is needed for, for instance, synapse formation, synaptic transmission, neuronal differentiation, and normal glial neural interactions. So in the case of a disruption of this architecture, as shown on the right, where you have an excess amount of cytosine present, there's a reduction in membrane fluidity and then a disruption of the normal signaling activity which will affect the various processes. So for instance, you'll get this organization of myelin components, an increase in inflammation, um, synaptic dysfunction, and external uh, defects, which ultimately all give rise to a state of demyelination and neurodegeneration. Next slide, please. 
if we focus on the oligodendrocytes themselves, then the Twitcher mouse model is actually very useful. So the Twitcher is a naturally occurring mouse mutant caused by an abnormality in the gene coded for uh, Galactoceramides. It's therefore genetically equivalent to uh, Krebber disease and is characterized by a cytosine accumulation. And what you can see on the right is um, these oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the OPCs, and the immature and mature oligodendrocytes. And in the wild type, you get differentiation of your OPC to an immature oligodendrocyte and then accumulation of the various lipids and proteins to give rise to the mature oligodendrocyte. And what you see in the Twitcher mouse model is uh, an accumulation of cytosine over time and with that, an effect on both differentiation and maturation as well as apoptosis. So the differentiation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells into your mature um, oligodendrocytes is negatively affected. As you can see here, they sort of get stuck in the immature phase. And in addition, um, the apoptosis, which is the program cell death um, um, of these cells is increased. And the thought is that the, the apoptosis could be mediated by the release of, for instance, cytochrome C from the mitochondria. And cytochrome C is known to be involved in the activation of, of certain caspases, which are key enzymes um, that um, mediate the apoptotic pathway. In addition, the pathways such as the AP1 stress pathway could be upregulated and is being shown to be down regulation of the NF kappa B pathway. So all of these um, contribute to how the increase in cytosine can lead to a, um, a state as seen in this particular neurodegenerative disease. Next slide, please. So the current standard care for this disease is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, where the sources of the hematopoietic stem cells can be either the bone marrow or umbilical cord blood. In one study, the transplantation of a cohort of asymptomatic infants proved successful, while the success rate in the group that already displayed symptoms was less effective. So this suggests that, that potentially the timing of the transplant is very, very important. Furthermore, there's been success in treating late onset Krebber disease where central nervous system deterioration was actually reversed following allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And it's theorized that basically the donor stem cells can help to produce healthy microglia that populate the nervous system and in this way deliver the functioning enzyme. And this type of treatment may therefore help restore some degree of normal myelin production and maintenance in individuals affected by this particular disease. So I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Ivan Holt to um, take you through the clinical trials. Thank you very much, um, Carola, and good evening, everyone. So um, I'll take you just uh, through two trials that have been done, um, two fairly long-term studies, um, one um, both about 15 uh, years long. Um, and the first one um, that uh, we'll, we'll talk about is a study from uh, Pittsburgh, uh, which was published in um, 2017. Next slide, um, Ellie, please. So the aim of this study um, was really to um, determine the long-term results of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation that was done in the first seven weeks of life on early infantile crab disease. So while we are obviously so interested in this infantile crab disease is um, because We've seen that the, the, adolescent, the juvenile adolescent and late onset Krebe disease actually responds quite well to stem cell transplantation. However, the infantile one, the results aren't um, quite there yet. So um, it's not as, as good as the later onset ones. So the subject criteria for this study were really obviously newborn babies. And they had to be diagnosed uh, with Krebe disease uh, via newborn screening or because of a known uh, family history. So 
as a kind of described crab able with is autosomal recessive. So both parents would have to have been carriers to produce um, the disease in the child. And um, they only received a hematopoietic stem cell transplant within seven weeks um, of their birth. There are 18 subjects, 11 girls and 7 boys. So of those 18, 16 received unrelated umbilical cord blood. Um, and that is um, usually allogeneic cord blood is, is um, used because it is readily available um, and um, can be um, procured quickly as opposed to bone marrow transplantation. Two, two um, subjects did receive bone marrow transplantation um, from matching donors. And um, of those 18, 13 survived long term. The methods of monitoring um, of these patients um, over their lifespan was brain imaging, measurement of um, a several spinal fluid protein, peripheral nerve conduct conduction velocity, and neurodiagnostic tests, visual and brain stem auditory evoked responses, and standardized neurobehavioral evaluations. The um, next slide, please, Ali. The results um, of the um, of the study. Sorry, um, we have there we go. Um, the cerebral spinal uh, fluid protein levels, uh, which is one of the sensitive indicators of uh, central nervous system disease decreased post-transplant uh, and continued to decrease over time, but still remain relatively high to um, uh, children, um, children with heart disease. So early patients were found to have normal galactosylvose enzyme activity post-transplant. So the enzyme um, activity certainly increased. And um, however, clinical symptoms um, did not um, in, improve to full uh, normality. And um, 10 out of the 15 uh, managed to walk uh, with assistance, the other five could not walk. Eight out of 14 uh, did not have scoliosis, which is, um, which means the core muscles and back muscles could um, um, manage their, their body weight. Um, nine out of 15 uh, were able to eat without aid. The rest had to be aided. Eight out of 15 managed to be toilet trained. Seven out of 15 um, did not have su a hip subluxation, something that is very common in these patients. And eight out of 15 um, did not have to have tendon release surgery. Because spasticity is such an issue in these um, children, they often have to do tendon release. So eight out of 15 actually um, did not have to um, um, did not have to have the surgery, which is encouraging for those patients. Um, next slide, please, Ellie. The cognitive development um, certainly did improve um, to some degree. However, it um, was sometimes difficult to um, assess cognitive development because the motor development um, did not improve as well as had been hoped. Um, only one subject out of the 15 um, reached a um, normal um, cognitive um, development um, on the 50th percentile. Motor development, um, as I said, did vary greatly um, amongst the, the group, and that is um, dependent on um, corticospinal uh, tract involvement during um, um, at birth. And only three subjects worked um, independently. Seven subjects then worked with um, assistive devices. Five subjects, as I said, were unable to work at all. Um, all subjects um, received um, a physical therapy, of course, 
and um, Edward, one subject that advanced to eligibilities within two years of transplantation. So varying degrees of um, motor function amongst um, those um, subjects. Nevertheless, overall, a, a general in, improvement um, in, the, in the condition. Next slide, please. The second study that um, I want to show you is one that was conducted um, at Duke University um, in the US. Now, uh, Duke University is a university that has been involved um, in hemopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation in, in private uh, patients for over 20 years now. Um, Joanna uh, Kutzberg, who is instrumental in using um, umbilical cord blood um, uh, transplantation uh, for central nervous um, disorders was involved in this study. Next slide, please. Um, the aim of this study was really to uh, determine whether the long term results of hemopoietic stem cell transplantation on early infantile cardiac disease was better if done. Uh, within a month of birth as compared to after a month. So again, we're looking at the timing of um, the stem cell transplantation in the long-term outcome for uh, these children. And again, about 19 and newborn uh, babies uh, were um, subjects um, in this trial, and they were diagnosed uh, uh, with cardiac disease under violent um, mutations um, or abnormal neurological testing imaging at birth. And they all received a hemopathic transplant within the first two months of age. Um, some subjects, as I said, received as a transplant within 30 days of life, then, and another cohort received um, transplantation between 30 and 60 days of life. And um, they had a minimum of five years follow up after transplantation. In this study, the outcomes were analyzed um, in uh, two parts. There was um, primary outcomes, um, which included mobility, communication, and feeding. The secondary outcomes um, were school performance, hearing and vision loss, dental problems, seizures, spasticity, aspiration, and bile problems. And um, of the um, 19, 18 um, patients received uh, unrelated umbilical cord blood transplant, and one only received a bone marrow transplant from a match related donor. Next slide, please. So um, the results uh, basically at, at five years, um, 15 of the 19 patients had um, survived and had um, durably engrafted. Um, the stem cells and all had normal galactosilbrous enzyme levels. At 10 years, the um, only 14 subjects um, were remained alive. And actually, they found there was no statistical difference in survival um, if they received the transplant less than 30 days versus uh, greater than 30 days of life. Next slide, please. But the um, primary outcomes, there was a difference between receiving a transplant within 30 days as opposed to greater than 30 days. Um, mobility was definitely better. Um, communication was also um, better at five years and 10 years if they received the transplant less than um, 30 days of life. Feeding, however, was uh, not significantly different um, at five years. And really only one child out of um, the remaining um, 14 could feed themselves um, independently. So, so feeding not um, really influenced by uh, 
stem cell transplantation, however mobility and communication were. Next slide, please. The second, the results of the, um, the secondary function, um, it must be noted that all these children still exhibited spasticity. That did not um, change despite physical therapy and the stem cell transplantation. However, schooling was quite encourage, encouraging, and um, those survive, that survived after five years uh, were able um, to attend school um, at an appropriate grade level. Um, and um, only one child that really required um, schooling um, assistance. Um, at, at five years of survival. Um, one child, however, was not able to attend school at all. Um, all patients had uh, normal hearing and vision, um, but as suspected, all patients had dental problems. Um, certainly, their feeding um, and swallowing function um, is severely affected by this disease and is not necessarily improved with um, hemopoietic um, stem cell transplantation. So differences of secondary function uh, were not actually uh, statistically significant between receiving transplant less than 30 days to those after 30 days. Um, nevertheless, um, I, I think the conclusion that we can draw from these two studies is that earlier transplant, so early diagnosis of cardiac disease is most important, and that's where newborn screening um, comes into play. It is an inherited metabolic disease, so it's important that newborn screening is done um, within the first 72 hours of birth so that the, the diagnosis can be made. Once that diagnosis is made, a decision um, to have a hemopoietic stem cell transplant must be done and um, stem cells must obviously be sourced. Umbilical cord blood um, stored either from a brother or sister can be used in, in these um, scenarios. And um, because autologous cord blood um, cannot really be used uh, because it is a, an inherited genetic disorder. So perhaps, you know, th those um, stem cells from that child will not uh, produce um, uh, galactocerebrose um, enzyme sufficiently. Um, so it probably was um, cord blood not used and therefore stem cells stored from a brother or sister useful, or alternatively to find um, stem cells from a public cord blood bank. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we do not have a public cord blood bank, and stem cells, um, cord blood would have to be sourced through the South African bone marrow registry, um, which is, is certainly possible, um, but is a very costly exercise. So, in a nutshell, that is crab A disease and um, the use of um, hemopoietic stem cells um, in, in, um, trans in the uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation in the treatment of this disease. So, thank you very much for listening, and uh, we will now welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Carola and Yvonne, for, uh, for the presentation. Um, we've got two questions. One came through, which you've actually already answered, Ivan, uh, just asking about whether autologous cord blood can be used. So thank you for, for covering that already. Uh, the second question that we've got here is, is enzyme replacement therapy not an option as a treatment for crab disease? I'm not too sure if, we, if um, Carola or Yvonne would like to answer that one. Um, yeah, I can I can take that one. So, um, okay. enzyme replacement therapy isn't really an option as um, the recombinant enzymes that would be utilised are actually too large to cross the blood-brain barrier where 
this enzyme is required within the um, within the, the the neural cell. So, so the answer to that would be unfortunately no. This isn't an option for treatment. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Carola. I don't think we've got any other questions that have come through. Um, oh, hold on. I think we've got one here. Um, uh, so the question here is, what is the possibility of a brother and sister both developing crab disease? Yvonne, maybe you can take that one. Yeah, uh, so absolutely there is um, definitely a possibility because it's an autosomal recessive disease. So the parents are both carriers and um, they have a 50% chance of um, you know, a child uh, with, um, with the disease and so if they do not um, undergo um, any um, embryo testing before, um, say, falling pregnant, then, you know, the chances are high um, and um, these people need um, a very intensive genetic counselling. Um, should they have one child with this disease, um, hopefully they will receive genetic counselling and they can make a decision for um, the reproductive future. If they are able to afford it, um, it would be suggested that they have IVS where they create um, a number of embryos that are tested for that mutation and then obviously only those without um, the mutation be implanted so that we can actually stop the uh, progression or, or of the, or the carrying on of this disease within that family. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, we've got another question here. What is the role of intrauterine enzyme infusion? Um, I, Carola, I don't know if maybe you want to answer that one. Right, so sure, intrauterine enzyme infusion. Um, I'm not sure whether that would really play a role in this particular case because um, the lack of enzyme is in the, um, the child and that is where you need the um, functioning enzyme to prevent the accumulation of the cytosine. So um, I'm not sure that that would really be um, that would be helpful in, in this case. I don't know if anyone, if anyone wants to add anything. Yeah, no, it, I, I don't think it would be, you know, you would need to, um, the enzyme has to get into the central nervous system and um, that, that, is, that is what is so tricky with um, enzyme replacement therapy. That uh, firstly, intrauterine. I mean, even if it's, if we had to inject it in the um, umbilical vessels, the um, the enzyme is too large to cross the blood-brain barrier. We actually need to have endogenous cells creating the enzyme to stimulate myelination. So I must say I, I haven't um, I haven't heard of that. Um, the um, Yvonne. Oh. Sorry, we just there's a, there's an addition to the question that just says um, similar to intrauterine transfusion as being done by FMF. I'm not 100% sure what FMF stands for. Um, yeah, so that was just. Yeah, no, uh, it it wouldn't. Um, it, it doesn't work in this case. Um, we do need to get endogenous enzyme, I mean, enzyme into the, the, the CNS um, and uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. So the only other alternative to this would be gene therapy, which um, they, and as Carolus said, are, are studying that in mice, but it hasn't progressed much um, further than that at the moment. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Dr. Pilar, I hope that, that answers your question. Um, if anyone else has got any questions, you're welcome to send them through. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions as yet. Uh, so I think um, perhaps we, we can wrap, uh, wrap up. So uh, just to say a very big thank you to, um, to Yvonne as well as Carola for the presentation today. And thank you so much to everyone who has dialed in. I hope that you have found this uh, beneficial and uh, 
given you another understanding of a use of cord blood stem cells. And if you've got any questions after this, please do reach out to us. And thank you so much for taking the time. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone.